this session is uh, who to aha refactoring story by gopal s akshantila uh, gopal we are glad you are joined us today so without any further delay over to you gopal hey guys uh, thanks for attending the start our to aha refactoring story so i'm gopal s akshantila i'm a senior software engineer at salesforce my twitter handle and my website uh, feel free to reach me out to talk to me if you have any doubts after this talk and let's get into the talk what's refactoring um, most of us think refactoring is like uh, maybe uh, just uh, putting code from one class to another using id shortcuts but let's ask the person who wrote an entire book about it as per him refactoring is like altering the internal structure without changing the external behavior that's like uh, uh, that brings me to the goal of this talk which is as a dev i need to refactor to make my code base refactorable that's a recursion over there but that's like just saying i want to build my code pieces like the, the lego pieces uh, why lego pieces because they're the ones which can be replaced reused and most importantly they can be composed together to build different structures so as long as your component is isolated like lego pieces my point is uh, you can sort of refactor and change without affecting the external components which are dependent on it but let's see what sort of uh, uh, what sort of how can we actually see uh, see this in action yes first of all how do you pitch this story for funding so we're all uh, busy uh, ref, uh, you know building features and of course managers are not very interested to fund you for refactoring there's always something to refactor but that said there's always there's a small trick that you need to uh, follow that's like speak in their own language and this worked for me like i came to my man i went to my manager saying that i have these three things like methods obstacles metrics what sort of methods i'm going to focus on and obstacles that my code base has for for extensibility readability etc and what metrics will i use to prove my point that i have refactored and we have achieved something better so the methods that we're going to focus today are just two two of them but uh, uh, i promise these two are going to change the face of your code so it's like human readability first of course as you know code is for humans and of course machines doesn't need refactoring they can run initiative code and then component isolation as we have seen if you want to build components like lego pieces and obstacles are uh, again we're going to focus on two simple uh, very common obstacles but then uh, we can see how just removing these obstacles can help code base a lot first one exceptions of course and which are uh, uh, omnipresent in all the of course all the languages today i'm going to focus on uh, java of course java is the simplest language that you can actually do functional programming on and one of the common and very uh, uh, very famous language that's the reason i chose java and we're going to talk about exceptions and um, mutability which is even more uh, predominant in java world jvm world of course we have some modern languages solving the problem but we're going to discuss on how they're solving and why we should also uh, uh, adhere to it even if the language doesn't give it out of the box and some of the metrics like cognitive complexity which is inversely proportional to the readability and testability of course which mirrors how isolated your components are we're going to see how that uh, can help us understand how good is our code base so this is the big picture hope you understood uh, what we're going to do and we i'm going to show you a lot of code on the slides and uh, but don't worry i'm not a big fan of of course showing code on slides but i'll be sharing you the slide deck and then i'll be sharing you a repository in the end where you can go back and refer and i'll, I'll be also sharing you a blog post where all of this is written in detail so you can read it at your own pace uh, but that's it today my intention is to seed you with ideas so you can go back and expand and connect those dots and sort of uh, get the big picture in this 15 20 minutes we're just going to focus on the high level stuff so request you to not focus on the details that uh, we're going to talk today and just grace through it so let's start with the obstacles obstacle one exceptions exceptions are the most abused language feature in my book because you can literally catch and rethrow anything and uh, this sort of brings a lot of problems especially when it comes to component isolation whenever somebody uh, when a, whenever a method is throwing an exception you never know where that could be caught and you really have to uh, hunt down hunt it down so i in my book exceptions are like worm holes right because they just take your execution point to somewhere else they are even very famously called go tos where uh, they suddenly uh, well for example let me take this analogy when you're sort of reading somebody else's code or your own code for that matter after a while and there are always two ids running and the one that runs on your laptop which is fine uh, it doesn't have any problem because it has so much ram to consume and the other poor one which runs you know skull which slowly reads line by line 
and uh, it sort of makes a picture slowly which suddenly gets shattered by a throw statement because uh, you never know where that gets caught so for example i will just talk few simple examples and how we can solve them to avoid exceptions for example this particular code is uh, trying to convey that okay i have some problem but i don't know how to convey when i don't have a problem so what i do is i just throw exceptions when i have a problem so in the end this sort of is bound to the caller the caller is supposed to handle this and a notorious caller might even throw it back and sometimes it just goes uncaught to all the stack and attach stackers so the actual problem here is it's not able to convey the uh, uh, the effect of absence for which it should actually use optional so in this code when there is no problem it should return optional dot empty and you could see you can happily uh, get away from exceptions and now the caller is no more uh, sort of bound to catch it or handle it or even rethrow it it can simply get a result back and just work on that this way this particular component verify user access is isolated whatever it does is inside this particular code piece and then you can literally refactor this without affecting the caller as long as you're uh, adhering to the contract of course so my point is uh, you should really be able to uh, replace all the exceptions with adts unless they are really exceptional adts of course stand for algebraic data types and uh, some of them some very common simple ones uh, my focus is not going complicated or complex like monads etc but i'm just going to focus on simple adts that you, you can use that come out of the box or maybe from some third party library like optional and tuple which represents one into uh, one with another like a pair and an either uh, which is left or right uh, to be frank either is a monad but uh, it's not uh, not really scary it's just uh, Uh, just an interface having two different implementations. Of course, I can't go into details of this talk, but this particular link has all the documentation of what is an either and how how you can use it. We are also going to see some few examples now of how we can use either. And and with the advent of ma pattern matching in Java 16 plus, uh, these are going to blend more naturally into the into the language. So it's more uh, easy to have a switch case statement, etc. Uh, on these adts now that there is pattern matching available so one more example we can see is exception being misused to written multiple data types so sometimes a function might be in a scenario where i have to uh, written something if everything is good but then have to written something else uh, when some things are not correct but of course we all know there is only one written data type so in that cases we sort of resort to throwing exceptions in cases where i don't know what to do but this case is also the, the perfect Uh, fit for this is using an either. So instead of throwing an exception, you should be able to use an either and put your or uh, put your uh, exception on the left state. Again, I can't go into details, but once you understand either, you actually get to understand what it is. So and when everything is wrong, you can put it on the right state. So this particular component again is not dependent on exceptions, and it's totally returning back a result rather than throwing an exception, which is an unforeseen side effect. So. that's it my uh, so i say throw away exceptions never ever use it i mean just try as much as you can not use exception there can be exceptional scenarios especially working with legacy code but try to not use them and next we're going to talk uh, talk about mutable state um, i mean shared mutable state uh, it's a shared mutable state on a shared code base it's it's pretty scary uh, uh, i'm going to tell you why so let's start with the mutable objects as input params uh, so my point is they couple the components uh, so let's see with an example so let's talk with, talk about a function simple function which is just taking list of numbers and is just uh, summing them up returning result nothing fancy and uh, somebody wants to extend this particular function so he wrote uh, something called sum absolute and what he does is is take that numbers and change all the numbers to positives and then he is just going to reuse the same sum function to get all the uh, sum of all the numbers fine uh, it's all good and they have used the sum absolute in a particular production client code base and it's working they all went for a ga party again this is a simple example i want just to you to magnify what happens in production now now let's see what happens in production some other new jo joiny joined and then he wants to extend now the client wants to also use some function and he called some function here but then he got a result of 13 ideally he should have got minus 8 plus 5 and it's minus 3 but then he got this unholy result 13 why because 
uh, he just got bitten by a latent bug. Uh, in real production scenarios, we sort of end up uh, doing a very painful debugging session to understand that somebody has mutated your data set. And in my book, it's, it's not a problem of uh, some absolute who sort of got a mutable data set and then he took that as a license to do whatever on it. He mutated that. Uh, because uh, he got a mutable data structure. He can do whatever he wants. In my book, the problem is with the client that he is just passing around this mutable data structure to different points. Now, because of this uh, mutable data set, both this client and some absolute are tightly coupled so that once I call some absolute, I no more can reuse that num uh, data set. So this is a problem when you sort of pass these mutable objects as params. So mutable objects as in params is unholy for isolation. What about uh, the ones which has written types? Uh, you might think it's not so problematic, but it, there is even a bigger problem. Let me explain. So take one more example. Uh, so this is again a mock example. I, I love boiled eggs, so I keep using eggs in all my examples. So uh, <clears throat> imagine there is a laying egg laying date function and it has to do a DB operation to get uh, the laying date of the egg uh, based on its ID and it's a heavy operation, uh, as, assume. So assume there are two dependent components in somewhere to two different modules or something which are not connected at all. And the first component is doing, is a, it's called a is laid egg in the first half. What it does is it checks whether the laying date is before 15th of that particular month and then returns true or false. And the second dependent component calculates the age of the egg based on the laying date. Like it diffs from the current date and then it does that, okay? And then, Okay, one day what happened is uh, this is uh, laid in the first half wanted to add some logging. So he actually, when it has to log, he also need to log the month and the year. So uh, along with the date. So what he wanted to is, let me reuse the same date function. And then as date the field that is being there, and then let me mutate that to 15 and then log it. Now you can predict uh, what can happen, but let me also take you through. Uh, on another day, what happened is this uh, this heavy operation, uh, what they thought maybe we should optimize it. So they have cached it into a hash map like this. And they're now not computing it if uh, the egg ID has already been, uh, uh, been used before. So they just pick it from the hash map and give it back. All right, with this, now imagine what will happen. This dependent component two is affected because this guy has mutated the state without knowing that this is being cached in a hash map. And now the, so the, this dependent component two wants to take that, or he always gets the date 15. So this is the problem here. You, if you return, even if you use this uh, uh, mutable objects as written types, you got even a bigger problem like uh, mutation. This, this happens very regularly on a, a, a code basis because you sort of fix something or change something at one place and somewhere else breaks and you sort of end up uh, in a debugging session thinking, why is the state of the object in that uh, particular way? So all, this always happens because these components are invisibly entangled. I would call them like quantum entanglement where they both are in different modules, but just because uh, they're dependent on one uh, common component, which is returning a mutable set, everything just got jumbled. So it's also the problem with pointers in Java and uh, it might not be specific to Java, but uh, in for the JVM world, to be honest. So it's like uh, pass by reference versus pass. This is a very common uh, and very popular question looking at the upwards and the views. Uh, so I myself got beaten by it a lot of times. So whenever you sort of pass a mutable reference, it's like you can, anybody can do anything on it. So, but why is mutability predominant in Java code? Um, because power of defaults, mutability is the default mode in Java. Paul, sorry okay. to disturb, like uh, we have last 10 minutes of your session. Sure, thanks. So mutability is the default mode in Java and uh, make immutability your default. That's what I would say. And that's not easy, but just like uh, any other things in life, we need to adhere to discipline to be the default. So uh, some quick wins, uh, make a habit of uh, using final before you watch so your uh, references are not tinkered, follow a mutable strategy from Oracle documentation. And if you're in pre-Java, you can use uh, different third-party libraries like Lumbok. And Java 16 plus, of course, has records as well. And Java is doing its part probably to uh, sort of go slowly towards this immutability. So, but then still I would uh, uh, encounter some anti-immutables who say, hey, immutability is, is only for multi-threading. 
I would tell them my brain is already concurrently running with all the distractions. So uh, there's no point saying that it's a single thread or multi-threaded. If uh, it's about reading code, I have to adhere to immutability. And immutable objects doesn't fit my imperative style. Of course, as uh, you can see, mutability and imperativity are friends. Like if you're using mutable data structures, you ought to invite a uh, mutation like this. But uh, if you replace your muta mutable data structures with immutable data structures, you have to use transformation like this and you don't have a choice but to transform but because you can't mutate it. So I would say immutability and transformation are like a couple, they go hand in hand, there is no choice. And immutability, of course, forces transformation. Uh, now I don't have to tell you who's the wife and who's the husband. So uh, doesn't immutability depict perf? Uh, even I would uh, add, add you a link in Oracle documentation, which says this is uh, overestimated object creation. It's not really affecting perf a lot. And uh, there is a lot of improvement in garbage collection, which sort of removes that particular problem. And Java is embracing immutability very slowly, as we have discussed. It has been introducing new and new stuff in each and every release. Uh, so you can go check out about all these. And we're also going to see Hello World, but I'm not going to go into details because of limited time. Uh, this is a sample application. Like I said, I, I'm going to share you a blog post where this is written in detail. I just going to grace through this particular topic. So imagine this is how the code looks like where there is mutable data set that's being passed along the, all the functions. And we can sort of uh, refactor that into uh, by changing the signature of the particular function, like instead of using these mutable data structures, you can instead return this either uh, and using immutable data structures. And uh, I'll be sharing you the code base where you can actually check in detail how this transformation or signature shift is being done. This is how all the components are being refactored into now each component is isolated and it's not, it, it's not affected by the caller. And uh, this is more like a math derivation where input of one function happens to be the output of another and vice versa. So you can fit them simply like Lego pieces. And this is how they sort of, how the function composition looks like. And I'm gonna just grace from the slide pretty fast, but uh, you can go ahead and check it out. Um, and how are we doing on our goals? I wanna talk about uh, cognitive complexity. Now this code uh, was how it was before and it had a lot of problems like mutability and try catching, et cetera. And this is of course is cognitive complexity without even checking any metrics. But uh, this code, this, this is our final code where we refactored and is it really cognitive complex? If you see a code like this, maybe I, have st I still encounter people who think this is cognitively complex. Uh, but let's check, uh, is really complexity, the one that talking about is complex. So complexity can be of different types, like accidental complexity, essential complexity, cognitive psychomatic complexity, and uh, uh, different layers like unfamiliarity versus unreadable, district versus non-extensible. So complexity here is essential complexity, and it could be unfamiliarity of uh, the person who has uh, seen it or has uh, not worked on Java 8 or uh, some lambdas and functional constructs. And it can even be strict uh, strictness, like we, that's pretty intentional uh, that we have done. Uh, this is because uh, we sort of want to have prepare some sort of lanes on which a particular uh, particular um, developer has to adhere to without breaking the rules. So it's strict because it doesn't let you mutate. You have to transform, and the operators are in charge in here. So. Uh, it's also good that when somebody wants to extend this particular code, he can't take shortcuts and do stuff. It's, it's like written once and it's extensible for future as well. That's it, to objectively measure cognitive complexity, you can check out my previous talks where I have uh, had in, in detail. And the testability part, even I just have one tip, uh, but I can't go through it because of limited time. So I'm just gonna grace. So I shown you how uh, a brittle test is written because of it. and. I'll be telling you how unit test is also equal to E2 tests. It's not it's testing internals. So uh, you got to separate static from signal. I'm just gonna grace through all these slides very fast. And, uh, and I always say testability should be first and test coverage always follows. So, and test and refactor should happen hand in hand. Uh, it's not an afterthought. So in the end, entropy is inevitable, no matter how many coding principles you follow the code as more people join in your team, new people, the, the entropy of the code base is gonna increase for sure. But our goal is not to make it exponential, 
but then to keep it logarithmic over the time so that you sort of uh, the code base doesn't fall out of place and all these things that we have discussed before will uh, those are very simple tricks and tips and you can follow them along to keep your entropy in check never ever do this just go ahead and refactor your code base uh, in the end uh, because if you do this, uh, this might can happen, especially when you don't have tests. And actually, let the last quadrant empty to for you to imagine what all can happen if you do it. Always uh, refactor incrementally. It's all, it's okay to be just good enough as long as you have tests backing up. You can always uh, find time to refactor it more. And I want to end up this talk with this uh, great quote from Clean Code. Even bad code can function, but if code isn't clean, it can bring a development organization to its knees. And never let that happen. You can find uh, the slides here, the code here, and the blog post here, as I promised. Uh, please go ahead and check, and you should be able to expand this 15, 20 minutes to some two-hour stuff. Uh, you can be able to connect your dots, and always reach out to me if you have doubts. And thanks a lot. Hey, thank you, Gopal. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.